Welcome, welcome. This is Talking to the Internet. I am pleased and honored to be joined by Jason Snell of Six Colors and the Incomparable and the Relay FM Network. And Jason does a lot of talking to the internet. Let's just put it that way. But he does it in a bunch of different forms. And my hope is through this conversation uh, that we can learn a little bit about why he does it. We can look at the human side of, um, of Jason and, and what he does every day, all day, um, and all the things that we get to read and listen to and just uh, see what we can learn from him. So thank you, Jason, uh, for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate you you taking the time. Thanks, Corey. Um, I, I look forward to revealing my human side and not talking at all about my robot side. Well, so the funny thing about that is I, 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 I listen to a lot of your shows, right? Like, so I'm an upgrade every week, right? Like when I, before I leave awesome. my job, I download Upgrade. And I listen to it on the way home. And then I've read Six Colors, right? And I've, I, it was funny. You were talking about it, I think, yesterday on Upgrade, uh, uh, answering one of the questions and you're about how do you, do you download all the shows, right? Or do you download all the episodes? And it's like you said, Incomparable is really one of those ones where you can pick and choose. And I do that because I'm not interested in everything yeah. that's on Incomparable, but I'm interested in some of the stuff. Everybody's so apologetic when they tell me that they don't listen to every episode of the Incomparable. And like, literally, I am the only person who should listen to every episode. And I'm not, I already was on it, so I don't need to listen. So, there are so yeah, many. Yeah, it's fine. There are so many. There's 500 episodes. of them, and it's and it's me basically talking about things that interest me. And I made a choice in 2010 that I continue to live with, which is it's a large panel that rotates, and it's about whatever kind of topic I want. And you know, it, it's a textbook what not to do about a podcast, which is what is it about? It's like it should be it should be focused on a thing. That's how you get a successful podcast is you focus very uh, clearly on a thing, but among other things. But I, I feel like that's kind of part of the the secret. And I didn't want to do that. I, I didn't. I made a choice to not do that. And I wanted to show where I could talk about a lot of things that I'm interested in instead of like limiting myself to one because I felt I was interested in too many things. So that's why it is a pick and choose kind of thing because most people are not going to be interested in all the uh, books and movies and TV shows and comics and drafts and other things that we do like so I, I it, it's people are apologetic about it. And it's funny. It's like, no, nobody should listen to every episode of The Incomparable. <laughs> really. It's just uh, pick and choose. That's that's what it's for. Yeah. So can we can we go to your entry into talking to the Internet? Right. I mean, you you measure you excuse me, you major in communication journalism. Right. Like you have this idea that you want to communicate ideas well, to people. And I, I should say, um, you say that the the I went to UC San Diego and the communication program at UC San Diego is not a mass communication um, make TV shows do podcasts program. It's uh, human. It's language and human communication essentially, along with culture and how you know how how ideas are communicated. It's very social science kind of stuff. So I did work at the school paper, and that's where I learned a huge amount about doing journalism. Um, I took every journalism class that was offered at UCSD, but there were like three of them. So my major is actually in thinking kind of big picture about mm. um, how we communicate and the media, you know, medium you use and how that affects what you do. And I was experimenting with like I, I started Intertext, which was a, you know, Internet distributed fiction magazine in PDF and plain text that was like experimenting with what you could do with the Internet as a communication medium. And, you know, not for a class, just because I was curious about it and I had access to page layout and stuff at the at the college newspaper and and so you know from the beginning I was really interested in in it from a, a big picture standpoint of like the internet as a way to communicate and in those days in the late 80s and early 90s you know most of the people on the internet were um were really hardcore computer nerds but also it was increasingly sort of like college students who could figure out enough to get around and it was just before the internet and the web it, really it's just before the web happened and so that was when the, the internet started to break bigger and bigger and bigger once the web got there but I was there it's funny because then I worked in magazines for 20 years and people are like oh you're a you're a magazine guy and it's like you know the internet was actually my thing from the beginning that I was interested in the problem is when you get out of college in 1992 you can't really get a job at an internet publishing company. That's not 
that wasn't a thing. If you wanted to make money and have a salary, you got a job at a newspaper or a magazine. And so I did. So, so was Intertext more about the content or was it more about the medium or was it more about both of those and trying to figure out what that looked like? Intertext was about, um, I mean, it was a side project for me that was an experiment because I was also like the news editor of my college newspaper at that point when I started it and taking a full load of classes and decided I didn't have enough to do that I would start this side project. <laughs> uh, but it, it intrigued me. And in those days on the internet, and I know this is impossible now, but back then you could literally have uh, a thing that didn't exist on the internet. And there was a fiction magazine on the internet. And I was writing short stories throughout high school and into college. Um, and my minor was creative writing. Uh, so I was curious about the, the like fiction magazines that were on the internet. I thought that was a really cool idea. And there, there was this guy named Jim McCabe who had a, uh, a magazine that uh, he had been doing for a couple of years and he stopped. He said, I can't do this anymore. I've got other things I want to do. And I thought, oh no, there's, there was one other that I knew of that was a science fiction only magazine. And I, I was like, well, why don't, why don't I start a replacement for the other one? Because I wouldn't want there to be no place for people to post stories on the internet. This is what the world was like in 1990 uh, or late 89, I guess, and, and early 90. So I did, or, or I guess 90, 91 is, I think Intertext's first issue was in 91 because volume one, 91, was a, it was an easy way to remember it. So, uh, so I did it, you know, kind of to fill a void and I thought it would be a fun project and I liked short fiction and I thought I would, I, I thought I would give it a try. And, you know, it was, so it was both. And, and in, over the, you know, however many 40, 50 issues of it that I, I did over the course of 10 years, it, uh, we published some really good stories and some really terrible stories because, as you might imagine, the pool is we're not paying you and you're a giant nerd who knows enough to be on the Internet. And as a result, there were not a lot of fantastic writers in that period, <laughs> but there were, there were some. And, and I, you know, I feel like I discovered some really good uh, writers, too, and it was, a, it was a fun experience. And I learned a lot because it was how do, you, how do you generate a magazine? And it was like I, I could generate a postscript file and zip it and place it on an FTP server. Well, now I need to know what an FTP server is and how yeah. to how to use that and get access from my college to some place that had access to. Like it was a whole chain, and then like plain text, you need to do a text version. And there was this guy Jeff Duncan who worked at at Tidbits actually, which is still around with mm -hmm. Adam and Tanya Angst, and he had a. Uh, he did the text formatting for me of a of a plain text sort of structured plain text version, kind of like Markdown before there was Markdown. Okay. And so I learned a lot, and I learned a lot about setting up a mailing list and posting on Usenet and saying this happens, and then and then Gopher happened, and I did a Gopher version, and then the web happened, and I did a web version, and so I, it, it got me to try out test drive in the in the '90s when a lot of this was happening, a bunch of different ways of distributing information on the internet and in this case it was just stories because that kind of hit me creatively and it was a fun thing to do that I was not doing in my professional life in my as a student or as a, a journalist and so it was a good combination I ended up writing about like a Mac user I, I was hired as their um, online editor basically to to kind of channel uh, what they were doing into an online presence and I, you know I went on to uh, really do a lot of that in my career before it kind of broadened to everything that Macworld was doing. I was like specializing on, I had a column, my first column in Mac user was about the internet. <laughs> Again, it was the <laughs> early days of it. Yeah. And uh, so it, it served me well career-wise, even though it was kind of disconnected from it to keep, keep playing with this new tech and figure out how the internet worked. Okay, so what what was your, I'm, I'm interested in this transition between college and then Mac user. Like why tech? Why was it because of the opportunity? Was it because you had a deep seated interest in that? Um, both of like all of the above? It was always like I, I say that I didn't have a plan. I knew I wanted to be a media kind of person from when I was a kid. It was one of those things where like my wife didn't even know what her major was going to be until her <laughs> junior year in college. Okay. And then took quite a while to figure out what she wanted her career to be. And I knew. I just, I knew, I didn't know what form it would take. And I tried a bunch of stuff, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. What was interesting is that I really got into, into computers and, um, and that was always an interest for me. And, and I think back that, that, um, 
knowing what you know now, you could look at you could have looked at me even in high school and seen the signs. In high school, I did a video class, I did a radio class, I did a, a the the high school newspaper. Like I was into all of that stuff, but I also ran a computer bulletin board and like I, I did yeah. all the computer stuff too. And um, it was always that combination. In college, I was the editor in chief. I also ran networking cables so that we could share files without using floppy disks. Um, so I was doing both then, and then I went to grad school, uh, to journalism school, and it was a similar thing that I was in the journalism school figuring out a lot of things that I didn't want to do in the media. I learned a lot of lessons like don't I don't want to do TV, and I probably don't want to do daily newspapers. Ironically, now all tech journalism has to do multimedia, and it's even more often than daily. So, oh well. But I, I did learn a lot of lessons there. But I was also like my my job in grad school was basically their desktop publishing, you know, kind of thing. I, I basically helped them do publications for students. So the students who were working in cl various classes could have a magazine at the end of it or a newspaper at the end of it. And that was kind of my job my uh, first year in grad school. So it was always the case that I was mixing my interest in uh, computers. And at that point, by the time I got to grad school and even late in college, you know, Max. And uh, it just went together. I met a person at the journalism school who was a senior editor at Mac user. And I said, do you have a summer internship? And she said, no. And I said, please, my mom needs me to get a summer, summer internship so I don't go <laughs> home. Um, and, I, I, and that was it. I was the summer intern at Mac user. And then they offered me a job uh, like three months after I left. And the rest is basically history. That was, that was it. So it was yeah. a natural thing. It was not entirely calculated. I, I kind of assumed that I would be a general assignment reporter or something like that. But I was... All, always interested in the tech stuff. I was always inclined that way. And so when the opportunity arose, I, I grabbed it more thinking, oh, this mixes my interest. This is a good internship. And that was kind of it. Yeah. So I, so I have a very similar kind of tech has always been there, right? I didn't, I didn't know what form it was going to be in, uh, my interest in tech and uh, technology. Um, education was what I was going to do. Like I kind of knew that from the time I was in fifth grade or sixth grade. I was like, I was going to be a teacher of some sort. But my, my story, similar to yours, is uh, we had a, a teacher in high school who he would create, um, we had a networking class, right, where we were learning how to do CCNA networking. And he would break the network, and our goal was we had to fix it. That way we could play Unreal Tournament, right? And it's like if we fixed it, we got to play, you know, basically after school we got to play Unreal Tournament. And it was like that's how we combined those two those two passions of like, I'm learning a thing and we're getting to do, getting to do fun stuff as well. So it, it's, it's awesome to hear, hear your story and how those two things kind of blended together. Um, get me to, I know we're going to skip a little bit of time here, right? Like, so you're at Macworld, um, you're doing, you know, you're doing the Macworld thing, um, yep. kind of running the show there. Uh, get me to starting the incomparable. Like how, how did that happen? You know, I was, it, it, it's the same story and, and the same I ran a, a, a blog in the 90s called TV uh, TV.org uh -huh. that was the same thing too is I just have a history of doing projects where I think I feel like there is something interesting to try that I want to try and or something interesting I want to say um, and then I want to explore usually using something that's in that's new and in 2010 which is after you know podcasts started happening kind of really in 2005 okay. Um, and we had a Macworld podcast, but I was never the the host of it. I, you know, it was and it was more like Chris Breen did it for the longest portion, and then you know I would be on it sometimes, but it was not my podcast. And I I had been thinking that I wanted to experiment with having my own podcast, but I wasn't going to take over the Macworld podcast, and I didn't feel like I wanted to start a tech podcast outside of Macworld because they were paying me and to be to do stuff for them and and I felt like that was not appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I had a Twitter conversation in August of 2010 with a bunch of friends where we were talking about uh, a bunch of books that we'd been reading lately like sci-fi novels and it was one, one of these kind of fun moments where it's like oh we read a bunch of the same books and we have opinions about them and this is interesting and have you read this and all of that and I and I don't even know why I thought this but I thought that the 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 Twitter stream is still there. It's like uh um we should do this as a podcast that was literally like this conversation we're having on Twitter. What if we did this as a podcast and um, something about me that is not true of everybody is I'm often, you know, a lot of people have ideas. Not everybody follows through on those ideas. I am a follow-thrower 
a lot more, I think, than a lot of people. A lot of uh-huh. people were like left it sit there and like, oh yeah, that's a fun idea, and it would never have happened. And I was like, okay, when are we going to do this? Let's do it. And we did. Like, we we had a Skype conversation. I think maybe the next week, or or maybe it was that week, and in 2010. And I recorded that episode, and I recorded at lunch hour at work with two of my coworkers another episode, and we didn't even have a name for it. And those were the two kind of like trial episodes. And I thought, this is great. Um, let's do it. And I came up with a name, uh, but mostly because uh, my friend Greg Noss had a domain that was theincomparable.com, and, and I had been using that for uh, for the successor to the TV blog. And I thought, oh, well, that's a fun name. Let's just call it The Incomparable Podcast. We'll just do that. And that was it. And, and little did I know. Yeah, little did you know. That, um, although, you know, every time you go into one of these things, there is a, an implied commitment there. But yes, little did I know that I would be doing that every single week for, co- you know, coming up 10 years now. But there it is. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing, right? I'm, I mean, just to go from a conversation with your friends to, you know, a thing that you've been running for almost 10 years, you know, very successfully. Like, it, I mean, it, it's really the range of content that you do, because I've enjoyed shows where you go, you all talk about the Hugo Award winners. Right. I've enjoyed shows where you where you dig into a movie in excruciating detail. I've mm-hmm. enjoyed draft shows where, you know, you and a, a group of people, it's like, it's just so broad, but at the same time, it that pop culture thread and that entertainment thread is so well woven. Um, I, I just, uh, I appreciate I appreciate that about you and about, you know, the network. So that's, well, that's great. It's been fun to do it. And, it, and, and it's been, again, it's kind of in the spirit of experimentation. And this is one of those things where I think my, my worldview and my attitude is not writing about technology and living in the Bay area. I, I definitely feel like sometimes it's a, you know, uh, Silicon Valley culture kind of thing. And I don't fit the Silicon Valley culture at all. And one of the reasons I think I don't fit it is I like, I think I approach this. Okay, this may be a little overly self analytical, but please forgive me. This I think, why, I, Jason, this is why I really wanted you on the show is because <laughs> I love your analysis. Like, I love your analytical nature. Keep going. So, I, I, when I was, okay, I'm going to back up. When I was in high school, one of the things I did, I, I went to a college consultant about where to go to college. And they, they had me take this like weird uh, Q&A kind of thing that was a test to find out what kind of things you were you, you were interested in and what your attitudes toward work and curiosity and, uh, you know, areas of interest. And it was sort of find me a major so that you could find schools that were good with that major. And what they came back with was fascinating because I was a straight A student. I finished second in my class in high school. And what it said was, your attitude is most like a, musician I'm, and I'm not a musician and I don't play music and I thought well that's weird because that's kind of a that's kind of not serious career track in a way it's a very different it's a creative kind of thing and uh-huh, it's not uh-huh. the I'm going to be a scientist or whatever and it's totally right it's totally accurate because when I say that I don't think I mesh with a lot of Silicon Valley culture, I think a lot of Silicon Valley culture, and and you know you see this in other businesses too, is okay. We've got an idea for a business or a product, and we're going to do a startup, and we're going to get funding, and we're going to build this plan, and we're going to make this product, and and here's the end point. And I've always felt like, and maybe this is just me because people do that. Like I've never felt like I could that I wanted to create something. Um, knowing the end product, um, if that makes sense. Like yeah, the idea does. that, um, oh, well, we're going to do X and Y is going to happen. And, I'm, and maybe part of that is that I, I like the journey of discovery. And part of it is that I really don't have that level of confidence in the world. And and I think, I think part of that is true, which is a lot of times when you think we're going to do X and Y is going to happen, Y doesn't happen. And I think it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of hubris in believing that we're just going to make Y happen by doing X. And I just, I don't believe that. And so The Incomparable is a good example of, I wanted to do it and see where it led. And it led to a different podcast than I really planned. And it led to a different career, actually, than I really planned. But I, I didn't go into it thinking, okay, here's my plan. I'm yeah. going to do this every week for for 10 years and we're going to branch out and we're going to make a network and then I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to start tech podcasting and it's going to be this podcasting is going to be more of my of my income than writing and I'm going to make a career change. And it's like, that was not the plan. The plan was, this is interesting. Let's see where it leads because in doing it, I'm going to learn way more about what it takes to do it and what makes a good one and what makes a bad one than for me to like whiteboard something and 
and then say, okay, here's the plan. And maybe other people are good at doing that, but I've never felt like that was a good idea for me to do that. I, I really need to get my hands on it and say, let's make some of this, whatever it is, and I'll learn. I'll figure out where the edges are and what makes a good one and what makes a bad one. Yeah, my, so my you know, little tangent, my, my research area when I was going through my PhD program was in um, entrepreneurship and technology entrepreneurship. And uh, there's a there's a guy out of actually out of um, the Bay Area there, um, and he developed a this philosophy or this way of thinking about startup where you do the minimum viable product and then you pivot right. So I'm hearing you tell your story and right ever since you started in high school through you know we're at the incomparable now. Um, you've had this entrepreneurial spirit and you've had this idea where okay this is what I think I'm going to do, but you've been open to what we would call in the in in, in our world pivoting. Right. Like, it's sure. like, okay, maybe that's just a different way I need to take it. Maybe that's a different way I need to take it. And it's just really, I guess one of the things that I've not gathered from you in any of the other media that I've listened to you, right? Like as you've talked on the internet and any of the other things is, I mean, this just this entrepreneurial drive, right? Like this, this like, okay, well, there's this interesting thing. I'm just going to go do it. And not necessarily that you wanted to do it to start a business and you wanted to do it to make, you know, an Uber, Uber billion dollars, right. but you wanted to do it because there wasn't a thing out there and you wanted to make that right. thing. And, there, and it's like, there's a, a new thing. Like, let's try this. What what could this be? And yeah. and and that is, yeah, I, I think that's the thread, if there is one in my career, has been looking at new, especially like new things on the internet and new technologies and communication formats and saying, oh, that's new. Um, I wonder what that could be. And it's not, oh, like usually what happens is you wait five years or you wait two years and you say, oh, people are doing this thing. How do we monetize it? How do we build a, a startup a business plan or whatever? And for me, it was more like, oh, there's a new thing. Let's try it and see where it goes and see where it leads. Because I think that's really exciting and it's a great creative outlet. And so my my history is littered with projects that were too soon. <laughs> um, and that's fine because they were, they were also always kind of side projects that were too soon that helped me also kind of be current on the internet and uh, you know on technology that I could use to to write and do in my job but yeah I mean I was too soon for blogging they didn't even have a name for it when we did TV which could have been parlayed into an entertainment could have been television without pity probably but it which got bought by NBC Universal but it it wasn't it was too soon and uh and intertext was uh was internet you know fiction like that there are lots of ways that could have gone but it was it was too soon and i was just you know I, that wasn't the point of it it was just to explore the the edges of the medium and the incomparable like i said the same way could it, it's not what i would make it, if i was putting together a business plan for the perfect podcast but it's the podcast i wanted to make yeah so okay so get me to you know, things are happening at Macworld. Things are happening at IDG. I've heard you talk about this in a couple of different places uh, before. Uh, I've also heard Stephen and Mike from Relay FM talk about, you know, Jason approached us and we were starting this network and it was basically like this perfect storm of we w we're doing a thing. Jason's making a transition. Upgrade became, if I'm not mistaken, Upgrade was one of the first like four or five shows that they launched, right? Yeah, we were there. It was like week three or something, week yeah. four of the network, because they launched in August, and our show started in September. Yeah, so tell me about, uh, again, less about the like the technical process between there, but tell me about your thinking as you're seeing, as you've put it, you know, it was time. You've, you've said that a couple, I've heard you say, like, it was time, right? Yeah, I mean... The the I mean the fact of my job was basically that I was burned out. I I got uh, accepted a promotion. I fought for a promotion to this uh, sort of uh, senior vice president of content for IDG Consumer. It was like I was the head of all the editorial stuff, including PC World and Tech Hive and Mac World. And I didn't like the job. We were you know there were endless series of layoffs, endless new bosses. Every boss had didn't understand our business and had to get reeducated about it. And you know it was that thing where they come in and they say, well, why aren't we doing it this way? I was like, because we tried that and it didn't work. And I'm like, well, let's try it again. It's like okay, and like let's do that. And then in six months you'll realize that it doesn't work. And then they would realize it doesn't work. And then they would get fired. And then there'd be a new one. and We do it again. Like it was a really dispiriting environment to be in. Yes. I'd also been in it for a long time. I was 
wasn't doing, I wasn't connected to the stuff that I loved, which was actually writing things and making content. Um, it was, I'm gl- the, the incomparable was really a lifeline during this period because at least I had something where I was making something every week. And that's really why, that's one of the reasons why I, um, well, that's not why I started it, but it certainly helped me do it. And, um, and so I decided, uh, after a lot of consternation, I just decided to quit my job because I was so unhappy. And, um, I went to my boss and I said, I, I'm out of here. Um, it'll be, I think it was like, it'll be 15 years or it'll be 20 years since my first day at Mac user. And that seems like a good day to end it. And they're like, no, 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 please stay. Everything's going to be better. We're going to turn around, uh, get it turned around. Please stay. And I said, okay, well, uh, they talked me into it. I basically was like, okay, two, two conditions here. One, I don't want to go to CES because I hate it. <laughs> and, and two, I, uh, I don't want to go through another layoff. Like, like if, if we have another big layoff, I'll do this layoff because it was a layoff that they were going to have me do. And I was like, I don't, I'm no, I'm not your guy. And they're like, you know, please, we, this is the, this is the, we're going to do the big turnaround. I was like, okay. Right. Like, and that was a mistake. I should have just said, no, I appreciate it. No. Um, but what that netted me was eight more months of burnout. Um, those guys all got fired and uh, there was another big layoff. And fortunately, because I had been very clear with them, that if they did another layoff, they should lay me off because I wasn't interested in going through another layoff. They laid me off, which meant I got severance, which yeah. was great because yeah. I, 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 so it was a fascinating little moment of, I tried to quit and I should have quit, but I would have just walked away with nothing. They coaxed me into staying. I got to plan and build my home office and do all of these things. And I, I didn't have one foot out the door exactly, but it was, it was increasingly, like, it didn't change any of the conditions of how unhappy I was. This new environment didn't make it any better. And then, obviously, they, they did more layoffs. And so, um, and so then, then it, it happened that there was that other big round of layoffs, and I left. And, um, and in terms of the podcasts, it, the timing was, like I said before, I hadn't felt like I could do a tech podcast. But if I'm going to go out on my own and start my own website, I, it's also an opportunity for me to start my own tech podcast. And I wanted it to be a lot of the things that The Incomparable wasn't. The Incomparable wasn't about my professional life. The Incomparable wasn't something where there were regular hosts. We couldn't do follow-up. We couldn't do like the the same level of kind of like, do you remember what happened on last week's show and now and the previous show and like the continuity that I think really brings a lot of strength to podcasts and that the incomparable kind of can't, after 500 episodes, it has some continuity, but it's like accidental at best yeah. because the, 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 the people are different every week. And I wanted, I wanted to show like accidental tech podcast or John Gruber's talk show or like hypercritical. I wanted, I wanted that show. I wanted to do that show. And at IDG, I felt like I wasn't allowed. We did Clockwise, which was fun and uh, a good concept that continues to this day. And I'm really proud of, of us coming up with that concept and getting it where it needed to be to be successful. But it wasn't the, you know, I wanted my podcast. And the Relay guys, I talked to Mike a few times and I liked those guys and I liked their shows and I liked that they went out on their own. They left 5x5 Five Five as a network yeah. about the same time that The Incomparable did. And I really, you know, so we had talked about that and everything that went into that. And I knew they were doing this. And so they were the first people outside of my family that I told. And I told them under the strictest secrecy. And I was like, look, I'm leaving. And you can't say anything, but I'm leaving and I would like to do a podcast and I'd like to do it with you. And, um, you know, they're back behind the scenes, apparently, with their minds blown about this, which was hilarious. Because for me, it was like, are they going to even be interested in me? Uh, but they were. And uh, and so we did it. So it was, it, you know, it was part of the strategy for my business because I was like, how am I going to survive on my own? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was also you know, primed by the fact that I knew about podcasts and I knew how to do them and I knew what I liked and I knew what I wanted to do. And Upgrade with Mike is what I wanted to do. It's exactly what I wanted to do. So that's a case where I guess I did if, you know, if A, then B. But it was a real short term. It was like, I am now poised to be able to do this. And he said yes, and it was great because I, I would I wanted to be, they were like, it was a new network, so it would feel pretty natural. I'm not coming into something late. Um, it benefits them, it turns out, because having another show with me, they, they, like, really gave them some, you know, appearance of, of kind of momentum in the early days. Like, they, this is more than just moving our shows to Relay from 5x5. Five five. This is us starting a new thing and building. Um, and so we brought brought Clockwise over and started Upgrade, and we went from there. But in that case, it is, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted my job to be doing six colors 
and doing upgrade and also the incomparable you know on the side but that those would be ways that I could get money <laughs> from various places and put it together in a pile enough to uh, support my family and uh, it worked out which is great so so it's really interesting like just the way you talk about it right because you said you know in there that there was a little bit of a are these guys even going to think you know, are they even going to want to entertain this idea of me coming in, into their network and doing a show? And they're in the background going, oh, my gosh, it's Jason Snell. Like, Jason Snell wants to do a show, right? So it's like – and you, and then even when you talked about it later on, you, you undersell it, right? You say about the momentum of the network, and I think there's a little bit of clout there. And it's like I don't, I don't say that in a way to um, denigrate or to, to put down what, you know, Stephen and Mike have done because they've done, they've done an awesome thing. But, I mean, you're bringing – you know, you're SVP of Macworld – Right. Like you're coming in to do, you know, a show on, on this network. And the reason I say this is because, you know, I'm I'm starting a new podcast. Right. So I send out I'm basically cold emailing people going, are people even sure. going to read it? Like, are they going to read it? And then two, are they going to click reply? And, you know, I sent the one out, you know, for, you know, you a while ago and then we had a baby and all that stuff. But it's like I sent the one out for you and you're like, hey, give it a shot. Let me know. Right. And, and it, the fact that you even responded, right. Like, it's just, it's like, wow. It's like this guy I listen to all the time. And this guy that makes such interesting or does such interesting analysis and the conversation has. So it's like, I, I, I think it's interesting has how we sometimes as humans go, ah, uh, and we like second, we second guess that. So I, I just, I say that all that to say, I appreciate, I appreciate you and I appreciate what you do. So thank you for for doing that. And if people haven't gone and listened to Upgrade, um, if you have any interest in technology, if you have any interest in um, Apple technology and streaming and you know those type of things, uh, Upgrade on Relay FM is just an absolutely fantastic uh, show. So I, I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will say one thing about it, which is it's all a matter of perspective. I was burned out and had spent you know a couple of years feeling really burned out and trying to escape from my job and felt like, you know, I'm watching uh, John Gruber do Daring Fireball and thinking I would love to do that, but you know I'm not, and being you know fearful about going out on my own and being able to do it and seeing all those podcasts spring up and being like I would love to be able to do that, but I'm not gonna you know kick Chris Breen off of the MacWorld podcast and make it my own eco trip. I'm not gonna do that, so I'm just gonna I'll I'll, I'll do some other stuff. And then you know the, we have layoffs and everybody's leaving, and there is one way to view that, which is I am a I am a Oh, he's the senior vice president. His picture's been in in the the you know the definitive Mac magazine for a decade and all these things. The other way to view it is I'm I'm burned out, I'm irrelevant, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm desperately trying to find a lifeline by starting a podcast from scratch when these guys already just did that and Mike for for example Mike Hurley already has a tech podcast weekly with two yeah. other guys so like I felt like you know I got lots of reasons if I'm them to be like we're not that interested why don't you do that so it's it's very nice that they didn't feel that way and they were be able to see a perspective that I was not able to see but in that moment I was not taking anything for granted cuz it was and again part of that is the burnout too part of it is just feeling like uh, everything is terrible, and there's no there's no light at the end of the tunnel. That's probably a train, and you know having all of that kind of feeling. And I, it took a while to heal from that, but I'm very appreciative that they uh, that they had a better attitude toward it than I did at that moment. All right, so let's let's tie into the arm's length, maybe not even that far away uh, side of of you talking to the internet. Tell me about your wife and your family, right? So you're you're gonna leave MacWorld. Um, you're gonna start this new thing. What uh, what were the thoughts? What were the conversations? How did how did all that go down? It's a process. Um, and I you know I've definitely talked about this before in a few places, including there's a a podcast on Relay that we called Free Agents that is called something else now, but the archive is still there. Um, that with David Sparks. And we talked about it there, but basically it was a process of, um, in 2013, when I was trying to th move up to like quit my job, I was, uh, I was starting to talk to my wife about it a lot. Then we'd go for walks and I'd be like, I'm really unhappy. And I think I've got a, I'm thinking of quitting and, you know, and it was a really, it's a, an amazing process. I was just talking to somebody else who's having some career, um, issues and I told them this story that, um, you know, 
the initial th- initial thoughts were concern, right? Because she's like, well, what does this mean for us? And what does this mean, you know, for supporting? And she didn't have a full-time job. She was working part-time as a librarian. This is not a, a high-income uh, job. <laughs> and we got two kids in high school, you know, one about to go to college. Um, what does it mean? And I guess one in high school at that point, but about to go into high school. And, like, we live in a very expensive area. Um, we bought our house a long time ago, but still, like, it's it's expensive to live in the Bay Area. And what was great about it is we kept talking about it and I kept talking to her about, and it wasn't me like pitching her. It was really just like, we go out for, to walk the dog and I say, what's going on. And by the time we got to the end of the year, she had come around from, I don't know, this is really scary. Do we want to do this? How would it work? To me being like, you know, the same old kind of, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. And, her attitude at that point was you got to quit your job. Yeah. <laughs> like she came all the way around because it went from the initial thought, which is I'm concerned because this potentially makes our lives uncertain. And over the course of talking about it, she came all the way to the point of, of, well, yeah, those concerns are there, but they're not new and I can understand them more now, but it's very clear that you're miserable and that's not acceptable. <laughs> so we need to do something different. And so I was very appreciative, and then I tried to quit my job, and they talked me into staying a little longer. But the beauty of that, like I said, was we kind of primed the pump at that point. We were very prepared to do it, and were given generously, you know, given severance to do it while they were paying me, which was great. So um, she was very supportive about it, and there were some things like she now has she she sought and got a full time librarian job, which actually pays for our health insurance now, which yeah. we were paying out of pocket before. Yeah. Um, my daughter's in college. We, you know, fortunately, a lot of my story is going to be, fortunately, we are long-term preparers. So we've been putting money away for college for my kids since they were born. We bought our house in 1999. Um, so we, you know, we have more insulation than a lot of people do in terms of having the ability to do it. We don't have like a a huge amount of money in a bank. We don't have an endowment or something like that, but we did, we've been around long enough. We've been married for 25 years now that um, we've had some preparing that we've been able to do, but uh, still super scary. And when, when it finally happened, it was very much um, a, how long can we do this? So there were a lot of conversations that were, Let's try this for six months. And, and we, we did a lot of – she's got an MBA. She's a librarian, but she's also got an MBA. <laughs> um, we, we, t- we, d- we talked a lot about, um, you know, what are the revenue streams and, you know, advertising on the, on the blog and how does that work and, and what comes in from the incomparable and, you know, what about upgrade and what's that going to be and clockwise and how do we and, – and are you going to be able to do freelance and for how long and how long does the severance last? And so we had a lot of conversations that were, we'll try this for six months that very rapidly became, well, we'll try this for a year. And by the time it came to a year, it was working and it was not a problem. But we definitely set some set – some, times to check in and spend a lot of time talking about it. And what's funny is now we take those walks with the dog and we spend all of our time talking about um, study strategies for my son in high school. And, and, you know, for the longest time it was what my daughter's college process was, which we've lost now. We can't talk about that anymore because she's in college. So that kind of worked, but we did spend a lot of time with that. But the, the business, we do check in about it, but it doesn't have that same tenor of like, how long are we going to do this? Can we survive? You know, n- the future is promised to nobody, but, a- and I wouldn't say that we're comfortable with it because it's a, a ultimately it is kind of a small business and a- anything could happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel like we are in a pretty good place where, where we're more confident that we can adapt and make it work. That makes sense. I, what I love about, your story and what I love about your telling, you know, you said that we're planners and we're preparers and things like that. And a lot of times we hear these stories of these fly off the hip people, right? Like where or shoot, off, shoot off the hip kind of people and they're, and they're, you know, doing this thing and doing that thing. And it's like, Oh man, Oh man. But it's like, there is a benefit and a value to being reasoned and being prepared. And that way, like when an opportunity like this comes up, you know, you have those conversations and you can actually make those decisions and you can go out on that limb because you prepared and you planned and you, and you know, okay, this might be a risk, but at the same time we can evaluate that risk, you know, based on, and it's like, you don't often hear that story. You hear the crazy outlandish, you know, wild story. So that's just, 
it's great to hear. Um, it's definitely great to hear that uh, side of the story or like a different side of the story. Okay, so if I made you pick one and you could yeah. only do one, you're not allowed mm-hmm. to do the other one at all, period. You have to stop. Would you write on the internet or would you podcast as your form of talking to the internet? Well, I I mentioned it earlier and this is the truth. I would choose podcasting not because I see myself as a podcaster more than a writer, but because I make more money from podcasting than writing now. Yeah. That's the bottom line. And and if I couldn't write anymore, I would turn all of my energy that goes into writing into doing more podcasting related things in order to make up for the money that I'm losing. But I, I as a purely as a business decision, I, w- I know and I would say like it, it, there are some questions about this hypothetical, which is like, am I unable to write? Um, am I barred from writing or can I just not like because I would probably still write things like I would set up a blog about something dumb or I would write a novel uh, another because I've written three and put them in a drawer. Um, I would do some writing if I could uh, anyway, but I would take that, you know, during the day work brain power part of my um my life and I would I would turn it toward finding other podcast opportunities because that is um and any any of the tech writers you know like John Gruber's like this too like we all in the last three or four years have seen the podcast revenue cross over from the writing revenue and that's a there's a few things happening podcasting is growing and is successful but it's also like blog advertising is you know almost gone um and, you know, I make the bulk of, of my living from podcasting and memberships at this mm-hmm. point, the supporters of The Incomparable and the supporters of Six Colors. And I make nothing from advertising on my site, basically. It's essentially gone to zero. And I get paid by Macworld to write a column for them once a week, which is very nice because I love getting a check from my former employer. That's the best. Nice. So one of the things I forgot to ask you before uh, that I wanted to ask you is what was your fallback? Right. When you were when you and your wife were going on these walks and you were talking and you were deciding you're going to do this thing, um, you know, upgrade and six colors and, and those type of things. If it didn't work out, did you have a backup plan? Well, I think my fallbacks were um, take more freelance. I, I, I wanted to build some stuff of my own and not just do all freelance. But backup number one would be to take more freelance and see if I could just work as a freelance writer. And backup number two would have been to apply for jobs, right? It would have been, oh, there's this job as a as the tech reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle or for the New York Times uh, San Francisco Bureau, or there's a an editor job at Bloomberg in the tech department, or you know, it would have been it would have been something like that. I would have started applying for jobs, or like so many of my colleagues have done. It would have been going and working for a tech company in some way, working for Google or working for Apple. I know so many people who work for Apple who I used to work with. And, you know, they're working for a profitable company that doesn't have massive layoffs in in a growing industry that isn't dying. Um, There's a lot to be said for that if you've spent like I spent my entire corporate career the first day, my first day on the job in the office in January of 1994. A guy who's still in the business, Cliff Colby, um, who works for CNET now, um, pops his head over the cube wall and says, did you hear anything about layoffs? Day one. (laughs) Day one. So I spent my entire career, 20 plus years in magazines and media, um, watching it die. So the fact that I know a half a dozen or more former uh, coworkers who work at Apple now in various places, um, like there's a lot to be said for getting out of that racket. And I, 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 you know, and people I know who are still in this racket talk about getting out of it too. It's hard. So, uh, you know, that would have been an option too, would have been um, working on app store editorial for Apple. Or, I mean, I know somebody who works at Apple University. I know somebody who does documentation at Apple. There, That would have been tough because we probably would have had to move or I would have had a really brutal commute and I would have preferred not to. Um, but it, all of those options would have been open. But I will say, I never applied for a job, even when I started, and, and which is not to say that every time I saw a job that got posted, I didn't think, should I apply for this job? But I didn't apply for any of them because I thought, would I rather do this than what I'm doing now? And the answer was always no. So if I could keep doing what I'm doing now, I would rather do that. Um, And 
I've been able to do that. So I, I've kept that. And also with my kids in school, like my son is a sophomore in high school. I, I, um, moving is not an option. Like I, I have had a couple of people talk to me and in the end, that's been one of those things too, is not only, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate and I'll, I'll just say this, what I'm doing is successful enough that most of the jobs that people have come to me to talk about, they, it, it seems unlikely that they would be able to pay me more than what I'm making yeah. running my own business. And then the requirements are going to be, you need to commute or you need to move or you need to do this thing that, that you don't like. <laughs> and it's like, I'm doing lots of stuff that I like. So, you know, I had a big tech company, um, talk to me about what it would take for me to, um, or they didn't, they didn't, they, they, we ended up not doing an interview, but before that moment, my wife and I had the conversation of like, what would it take for you to, what, what job offer would, would let you take this job? And then secondarily, what job offer would make you take this job and move the company or move, move the, the family to where this company was somewhere else on the West coast. And the answer was a number that I, that no one was ever going to offer me, right? So it was that moment of like, no, this is this is what I want to do for na- for now. You know, you never know, but this is working, and there's nothing better than this. So um, I imagine that one of those opportunities that I passed by or that passed me by, I would have been more aggressive about. But um, I haven't had to go there, so so who knows? But you know, I, I don't know. I, I I I'm split on whether I would actually go behind the wall and work for a company, a tech company, uh, in some capacity, whether, whether when push came to shove, I would want to do that over working in the media. And, but the, that's the dichotomy, right? Yeah. Is the, the media gets to be as truthful and, and, and brutal and honest as it, as it can be ideally. Um, and when you're behind the wall, you're working for the, the man, you're working for the company and, you know, you're doing marketing, you're doing PR, you're doing documentation, which is, you know, a little more neutral, but like you're, it's a big change if you've been trained as a journalist. Then again, the pay is better, and the company's probably not going to go out of business. So there's a lot to be said for it. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, here's what I'll say: is the sub the subset of the industry that lost you. Uh, that's their that's their loss and our gain, right? For uh, what we get from upgrading six colors. So that's that's fantastic. Well, I I appreciate that, and I will say, after a while, it, like Chris Breen went to, and worked at Apple, and like we don't, he's still on Twitter and stuff, but like. Chris, such a great writer, and his writing's still out there, I guess, somewhere in Apple the documentation, maybe. I don't know where it is, how to's, I don't know. But like, he vanished. Yeah. Serenity called well. I, I was just going to say Serenity. Serenity was Dan, the one that was in my head. Yeah, Dan Frakes now has vanished because he works at Apple. Like, they're still around, but like, they're, they were people who made stuff that you liked, that you'd be like, I like their stuff. And now they're gone. They're behind the curtain where they're doing good stuff, and it may even be stuff that you see, but it's 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 that's also a thing you have to accept and and i appreciate you saying that that it's it's the world's gain and a- apple's loss or amazon's loss or google's loss but um it, it would also that's part of the factor right it's also me disappearing yeah. and even if it's a good job it's me disappearing and what we haven't seen a lot of is can you come back from that if it doesn't work out, if it turns out you don't like it, can you come back? Can you reemerge and say, I'm back, baby? I, yeah, you know, now yeah. I'm, now I, you have to start, I feel like you have to start from almost zero if you do that. So I would be, you know, it, it would be a hit to do that too. So, so taking, taking the big question mark, good question mark money from a stable organization, um, you, you kind of got to be committed to making that move. And I never felt committed to do that. It would be a hard decision even now. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we've talked about you being entrepreneurial and having ideas and doing different things that interest you. So how do you know whether to move forward with an idea? Like when, when does an idea bubble to the top where you go, okay, I actually need to, I need to do, do this. And then the opposite side of that would be, all right, this was fun, but we need to, we need to put that one away and Mm -hmm. and call it a day on that one. Um, yeah. What, what not to do is a really important thing. Um, I, I am constantly looking and questioning. Um, the rules change sometimes. Like as an independent, a person, I I do have those moments. Like YouTube 
YouTube videos is a good example where like Rene Ritchie recently, you know, p- pivoted to YouTube videos and he does YouTube videos. He's going to build his YouTube channel and that's the thing he's doing now. And, you know, bless him. I think, I think it's a great idea. I think that YouTubers are, I know some YouTubers, it's a very successful business. Like it's a very successful business. And you, the challenge is you, it's a huge investment in time and building up a, a new knowledge base and you need to have something to say. You need to not be, you got to break through, which is very hard. So you're, you're, you're taking a big risk and risks are, are sometimes good and sometimes tough to do, but you're taking a big risk and you're making a big time investment. And for me, like I was editing video in high school. Like I'm very comfortable making video. Um, although as a lone wolf, it's hard to make video by yourself, like just lighting and focus and stuff like that. It's hard. You can do it. And, and, uh, but it's so much effort. And if I was, I guess I would say if my business was flagging in some other area, it's one of those things I keep an eye on and say like, well, if this is failing, like you, you said, like choose between writing or, or, or video or podcasting. If writing just like was a belly flop, I, I got dropped by all my freelance clients and the website wasn't making any money and it was just a zero. I would, you know, that makes it easier to say, well, maybe I invest that time in, in doing videos, but right now it's going so well and it's, you know, and it's in an area that I'm comfortable with that, I'm not comfortable making that decision. So it's out there and I do make videos occasionally. Um, and I have another project that I, that I has been floating out there for a while now. And some of that is just like, do I have time to do it? When's the right time to do it? What's the right subject to do it? And then technically, how would I put it together? Because I'm, I'm going to be the one to do it. And, you know, you get those, you get those moments where you think, okay, I'm going to move ahead or you do an experiment. Like I, I've done some YouTube videos and it's been a good experiment. What did I learn? And, and is there a thing here that I feel comfortable replicating? And there isn't quite yet, but I continue to do those experiments. I did, I posted a video about how I edit podcasts on my iPad. And that was good because I've been thinking about a project related to that. And a lot of the stuff that stopped me was the technical stuff. It was like, where do I put the camera? How do I show my hands on the iPad screen? Because I can't do that with a screenshot. I actually have to show it. I have to show it in a video. How does the narration work? Like, and so I did one as a sample, basically to figure out how much work is it? Is the quality good enough? Like all of those things. And, you know, and then there comes a moment where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And the way I work is it means I put a, a recurring event on my calendar and I block out a few hours every week at least and say, do this now. Um, and that's a motivator for me is to say, oh, on Thursday, I'm going to work on that podcasting project that I'm working on, or I'm going to, this writing project, I'm going to do that on, on Tuesday afternoons or whatever. Um, and, and then it just kind of emerges. So it's not that different from the story I told you at the beginning, which is, I feel like I need to get my hands on this stuff and, and try it out and see where it might go and see where it might lead. And I'm not comfortable saying, Hey, I don't know anything about YouTube, but I'm going to do a YouTube channel. It's like, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to try some videos and see what works and what doesn't. And in, as a solo artist here, also, how much time does it take? What's the upside? What do I stop doing? And that's that's a big trade-off. Is like, how do I, what am I cutting out of my life in order to do this? And is that a thing I want to do? And, you know, I've dropped, a, mostly I've dropped a bunch of podcasts where I'm, and occasionally a freelance job where I'll just say, you know, this isn't working for me. Um, let's Let's move on. I need to use that for other projects. Do you have advisors that you run that stuff by? Like, do you have people that you talk to as you're, as you're working through it? No, I mean, I will talk about, about certain content stuff. I will talk to my colleagues who are doing or knowledgeable about that stuff. Um, I've definitely talked, I've had conversations with CGP Gray about, about YouTube. I've definitely talked to Mike and, and Steven a lot about the podcast world. I've talked to my, you know, colleagues who are, who are bloggers like Jim Dalrymple, you know, I, I, and, and Gruber, of course, I, I, you know, text with Gruber a lot. Um, about all sorts of ridiculous things. And those people all have a different perspective and it helps me get out of my head. And then I think about it a lot. I, you know, I will walk the dog and just think about it. And then, like I said, I've got um, on the weekends, you know, a couple pretty long walks with my wife and we will talk about stuff, including that. So it's a whole, yeah, sure. I mean, you do it long enough and you meet people and those ideally you keep those people around in your in your circle and you talk to them and you give them advice and they give you you advice they give you advice and it all kind of uh works out but um 
you know, and and then a lot of just personal reflection because a lot of it is not just will this work. It's it, it is really is this time investment worth it? And what do I have to? It, it's not just the time investment. It's what I have to stop doing in order to make the time to make this time investment. And and then at some point you just decide I'm doing this and you take a leap and and then you do it. So you're getting into it and I want to get into it more formally. Um, you know, somebody that's new to the industry, somebody that's new to wanting to communicate ideas through the internet, whether it's blogging, whether it's podcasting, whether it's making YouTube videos, TikTok, you know, like whatever it is, think talking to the internet as broadly as possible. Um, what advice do you give them? You know, um, it's hard because the truth is visibility is important. And if you don't have visibility somewhere else, it's hard to, it's a, it's kind of a crapshoot. You can try it and try it and try it. And I do believe that you have to be good to be noticed, but that's, that's necessary, but not sufficient. Like you have to be good and you have to be lucky. And I think that's always been the case with any mass medium, I think it's still the case. So first thing is you got to be good. Like you, you can't just be lucky. You have to, you, you can't control being lucky, but you can control being good. So the first thing to do is to try it. Like the, I, I did, um, I was actually on the board of uh, National Novel Writing Month and I did NaNoWriMo mm -hmm. a bunch. And the whole idea there is you just have to do it. Like stop Everybody starts writing a novel and then they're like two sentences and they're like, is this the right sentence? Maybe I'll delete these sentences and I'll try something else. <laughs> and the whole NaNoWriMo thing is get your words in. Just write. Just push the cursor forward. Turn off your inner editor. Get it out. Um, deal with it later. And I think that that is an important lesson for people who want to start projects of any kind is you can't do it by thinking about it. You can only do it by doing it. And if I know it's frustrating to hear... Uh, if you want to make videos, you just need to start making videos because the next sentence is the first videos you make will be terrible. And it's true, they will be. But um, you have to keep doing it because that's how you learn. And that's what I was saying earlier. That's how you learn how to get better. That's how you learn, oh, this shot is bad because and maybe I need to change the lighting or, oh, this editing thing that I thought I would do, I can't do. So I should change how I edit or I'm going to I'm not going to record my voiceover while I'm while I'm uh, recording my screenshots. I'm going to record the voice over later and just leave myself notes. And you get into some technical details and you're like, how do I make this better? What do people respond to? What do they not respond to? And you learn and you change and that's how you improve. And it's work. And and if you're frustrated, like with novels, people look at finished novels and think, oh, I can never do that. That person's a genius. I can't do that. And the truth is, no, they wrote terrible novels. And then when they finally wrote good novels, they were bad first drafts that they rewrote and fixed and changed in order to make them look like what you see at the end. It was a, it, it is, you were seeing the final product of an enormous amount of labor. It's not, so if you see a YouTube video and you're like, I want to do YouTube videos, but I'm never going to be like YouTuber I admire. It's like, well, not at first, but their first videos were terrible too. Um, so the, the first bit of advice is just, you have to do it. You have to do it and learn from it and grow. And maybe the first ones you do, you throw away and you never show to anybody. But at some point you've also got to do that real artist ship thing that Steve Jobs talked about. You got to do it and put it out there and just get the ball rolling. And then the other piece of advice is consistency. People value consistency. Um, podcast is a good example of that. But in general, like if you want to do a podcast, do it every week or every other week or whatever your schedule is. If you want to do a video, do it every other week or every week or every third week or however you want to do it. But like do it. Give yourself a deadline. Make sure you you um, you are doing it on a regular basis. Always question yourself. Figure out how you can do it better. And you'll get better. And at that point, I don't have any advice because at that point, it's sort of like, will people find you or not? It's very hard to give advice about how to become famous. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you, you do good work and hope that it happens yeah. is really all I can say. Like I, My website and podcast and all of that comes from me having the great fortune to have my face in a magazine for 10 years or eight years or however long it was. And my name on articles on a website and in a magazine. And I was able to migrate that and get enough of an audience to continue and then grow it. But like that was 
that was how I got my audience. I didn't start posting podcasts and hope somebody would find them. And so I don't, it's very hard to say what the secret ingredient is there. Yeah. And, and you know, you're consistent, right? Because that's, that's advice you gave me, you know, a long time ago via email. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I think one of the other things too is just, just keep showing up. Like you said, right? Like you have to persist, persist, persist. Yep. And then there is the, there is the luck piece of it too. So that's, that's really good advice. Uh, thank you very much. Do you have another minute for a lightning round? Sure. All right, so Jason, this next segment is going to be the lightning round. Uh, you have one minute to answer the following questions. You do not know these questions coming into this, and away we go. Okay. Overall, what's your favorite content on the internet? Favorite content on the internet? Um, wow, this is terrible lightning for me to think about it all this time. Favorite content on the internet? Uh, podcasts. I mean, I, I listen to not as many as I, I should, but those are th like, there are some podcasts that I absolutely love and I listen to them every week or uh, however often they are, um, they are produced. So I'll say podcasts. Also Twitter, like just <laughs> my Twitter feed is pretty great okay. and they're annoying people on Twitter, but they're also just great things to find on Twitter. But if I had to pick one, I'd say podcasts. I love, um, I, I love not all podcasts, but many podcasts. Okay. Who, Overall, again, who is your favorite personality on the internet? Wow. Favorite personality on the internet. Um, hmm. Uh, boy. I'm going to say... Oh, wow. This is so hard. Um, if I only have to pick one... I'm going to pick Mike Schur, actually, who is uh, the creator of The Good Place okay. and Parks and Recreation. But I first discovered him under a, his pseudonym, Ken Tremendous. He ran my favorite blog of all time, which was called Fire Joe Morgan, which was a sports criticism blog. And he now does one of my very favorite podcasts, which is called The Podcast, which he co-hosts with Joe Posnanski of The Athletic. They just, they just moved it to The Athletic. It is a very silly podcast where they, they uh, talk about sports and mostly baseball and draft things. So it is right up my alley. Um, so Mike Schur, great, my favorite TV creator, and he's also a person on the internet who I have um, admired on the internet for like 15 years now. Yeah. Okay. A creator show or content that is on the rise, something that our listeners should definitely check out. That's on the rise. Um, wow. What is, what is on the rise? Um, I'm going to say this is I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say this. So one of my favorite podcasts is The Flop House. Okay. And I'm going to say Elliot Kalen on The Flop House is still on the rise even though The Flop House has done like 300 episodes because Elliot was a writer at The Daily Show and then he was the head writer at The Daily Show and he moved his family to Hollywood um and he's like developing TV shows and he was the head writer on the revival of Mr. Science Theater 3000 and he just started a new uh mini series podcast that he's doing with John Hodgman about I Claudius the uh, the British miniseries from the 70s. And I feel like Elliot is about to break big, which is ironic because he's a very small human being. But uh, he will. I, I, I'm going to say Elliot Kalen is still on the rise, and he's the host of my one of the three hosts of my favorite podcast. Okay, two more. Favorite restaurant? Oh, man, that's a hard one. I, I was recently given a, I, I think, possibly questionable, but that's a long story, diagnosis of celiac, which means that I can't have wheat anymore, oh. which has really ruined my dining experience. I'm very sorry. Completely. It is the worst. But um, favorite restaurant, man, and they always close. That's the thing about restaurants is that, that you get a favorite one and then it's gone. Um, I'm going to say... My favorite restaurant is, drumroll, um, how about Roy's? Roy's is, uh, it's actually a chain started in Hawaii by a chef named Roy Yamaguchi, and it's a an Asian fusion place. I don't go that often, but I've been to the Hawaii locations a bunch, and there's one in San Francisco that I used to go to a bit when I worked downtown in San Francisco. And um, they just got a bunch of different dishes that are great and shrimp and fish. And there's a fantastic chocolate souffle that you can order ahead. And I don't think I can eat any of it anymore, but that that's a favorite. So we'll say Roy's. 
All righty. And then last but not least, the most important question that I could ask uh-huh. you of our entire time that we've been talking to each other. I'm sure. Sounds like it. Pineapple on pizza? Really? Yeah. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you see, although the Hawaiian pizza is uh, popular because it adds a little uh, a little sweetness uh, to the to the mix, which I like because make anything sweeter. That's my basic goal is can you make it sweeter? Then I like it more. But uh, my wife and I were just having a conversation about popcorn because it turns out our house is the popcorn where she eats, when you get the little popcorn tub, she eats all the cheese popcorn and I eat all the caramel popcorn because she doesn't like sweet popcorn and I think that she's a monster <laughs> for not liking sweet popcorn. So I like sweet on things, but I don't like ham. I don't really like Canadian bacon or ham. And my default pizza was always pepperoni pizza. And one time I had some Canadian, I think at work or something, a Canadian bacon, you know, a Hawaiian pizza, because that was what we ordered. Somebody ordered. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to eat the, the veggie pizza, so I'll have this. And I had the pineapple. I was like, oh, this is pretty good. And at some point, it, it just, I thought, what if, you mean I can just choose my toppings? What if I put the pineapple on my pepperoni pizza instead of the, the lousy ham? Because pepperoni is better than ham. Agreed. And I had pepperoni and pineapple, and I was like, no, this is the stuff. I love this. It's great. It, it it works for me. I don't know what to say. I know it's controversial. The great news is everybody gets their own pizza. But I I think the pepperoni pineapple con, uh, combo is the best because you get the salty and the spicy and the sweet and it's all happening. So uh, that's uh, I have to have the gluten free crust now. But still, the the pineapple. There's no gluten in pineapple, so it goes on my pizza. Well, Jason, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you've been more than generous with your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure to learn more about you. It's been a pleasure to learn more about what it's like to talk on the internet from somebody who is a seasoned veteran. Um, again, I just want to thank you and I uh, uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks. And thank you for listening. If you want to support Jason, you can find more information at sixcolors.com, theincomparable.com, relay.fm slash upgrade, And you can find him on Twitter at at J-S-N-E-L-L. I encourage you to become a member because all of the content that Jason makes is great. If you want to support Talking to the Internet, you can find us online at TalkingToTheInternet.com or on Twitter at at T-T-T-I podcast. If you found value in the show, please consider sharing it with a friend, giving it a retweet, or doing whatever you can to get the word out. We'll be back each week as we learn from the Internet's leading podcasters, YouTubers, bloggers, journalists, and educators about their experiences talking to the Internet. This has been a Swashwell production.